Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today and an absolutely warm welcome to the Smart Nation and you Let's Learn webinar on creative thinking for our digital world. My name is Karen and I'll be your host for today. Now, Singapore Smart Nation initiative is all about using technology to improve the way we live, work and play. And to realize this vision, it is important for Singaporeans to be equipped with digital skills so that they can take advantage of new exciting job opportunities, especially during this period where many of us are concerned about our careers. Now, this is why the Smart Nation and Digital Government Office and NTUC Learning Hub are glad to bring you the Smart Nation and You Let's Learn Festival. NTUC Learning Hub is proud to be the official continuing education and training provider powering the Let's Learn segment of this exciting event with something for everyone. Now, today's seminar is on creative thinking for a digital world. Do note that the session will be recorded. So if you'd like to recap your learnings, you can visit Smart Nation YouTube channel and a recording of the various sessions will be made available about two weeks after the festival. Now, I'd also like to encourage you to stay all the way till the end because we do have a post-webinar survey and two participants who complete the survey will win $10 fair prize online vouchers. Now, today we have with us Professor Jamie Anderson. Now, he is the Professor of Strategic Management at Antwerp Management School and a visiting professor at INSEAD. A repeated TED speaker, Jamie has been named as a management guru in the Financial Times and has also been included on a list of the world's top 25 management thinkers by the journal Business Strategy Review. So you are in absolutely good hands and feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function at any time and Prof will do his best to answer them. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Prof Jamie. Excellent, Karen. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and good afternoon, everyone. I should say good morning from my part of the world. I'm sitting here in Antwerp uh, in Belgium today. It was a great introduction, Karen, um, but one thing you didn't mention was my nationality. So now that people can hear me speaking a little bit, I wonder if you folks can guess actually which part of the world I come from, because although I live in Belgium, I'm not actually Belgian. So let's, I'm just going to have a look at the, the chat box for a second. Um, so let's see if people can type in. Can you guess my nationality, folks, now that you've heard me talking a little bit? Scotland, close. My father was of Scottish ancestry. I'm Who said British? Patricia. I'm not British. Oh, Tommy got it right. Tommy said I'm Australian. Very good, Tommy. You're absolutely right. I am Australian. Um, but just to let you guys know, I've been away from Australia for about 20 years, all right? So my, my accent is a little bit mixed up at the moment. Well, I hope, I hope you can all follow my intonation because as you know, for us Australians, English actually is a second language, but I hope you can, you can follow me here. All right, so what do we, oh, I love that. Thank, thank you very much. Sam is saying Aussie, Aussie, oi, oi, oi. Thanks, Sam. Okay, I like that. Keep that up. And by the way, Sam, if you're enjoying the session, you know, because this is going to be very interactive, everybody, you know, us Australians, we like a little bit of a laugh. So if I use some humor, I crack a joke. Don't be afraid to put the emojis, okay, in the chat box. You know, little smiling emojis and the laughing emojis, all that stuff. I like that. However, I am going to say something. I'm going to be checking the chat box from time to time, but actually the real place for us to interact during this session will be in the Q&A box, okay? The risk a little bit with chat is that you guys spend all the time playing in the chat and actually you kind of check out of the session a little bit. So to be honest, I'm not going to be looking at the chat so much only for those laughs. I'm going to be focusing on the Q and A box. So please put your questions in the Q and A box. Looking forward to that. All right. So what am I going to do? I'm actually going to share my screen with you for a second. And what I'd like to do um, is uh, I'm going to share with you just a little bit about what we're going to cover today, because as Karen mentioned, um, we're going to be talking about creative thinking in a digital world. All right. However, we need to think a little bit about the big picture because, of course, a big part of what we're going to talk about today is digitalization. However, we have to think about digitalization in the context of some of the big things that are happening in the world. All right. We are at the moment in the midst of a pandemic. And what do we start to see during this pandemic? digital organizations and digital innovation still thrives. While many companies in the world are struggling, while many companies are seeing declining sales or declining profits, those digital innovators 
Many of them are being very, very successful. They're able to be resilient even during the pandemic. So we have to keep that context in mind. We're going to be linking digitalization to what we've been seeing and experienced during the pandemic. But of course, there's something else much bigger happening in the world. And that's some big themes which also connect with digitalization. And those themes are related to sustainability, right? So whether we're talking about environmental sustainability, we're talking about economic, social, uh, economic sustainability or social sustainability, we also need to think creatively. And of course, what we also start to understand is that digital technologies can in many ways enable us to innovate in those areas, all right? So that's very, very important. And what am I gonna suggest? I'm gonna to suggest to you that the ability to think creatively when it comes to digitalization, when it comes to responding to the pandemic, when it comes to dealing with the question of sustainability, the ability for creative thinking is going to be your human superpower to thrive in the future, okay? Not just you individually, but to help Singapore as a nation to thrive. So what we're gonna be talking about in the next, well, I guess about 75 minutes or so now, we're gonna be talking about how do you become a creative thinking superstar and how do you leverage digital technologies to thrive, all right? So just, just very quickly now, you can use the chat box. How excited are you? Come on, I want you to type into the chat box, you know, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is very excited, Okay, as Koma, let's have a look. I just want to quickly check in with you there. Let's have a look. How, how, what's the excitement levels now, folks, with that build up? Oh, great. Patricia's at a 10. Sharon's at a 10. Esther's at a 10. Chua Swing, 100. I like that. That's already been creative because you're not using the scale that I told you about. I like that very much. All right. Very good. 10 out of 10. That's good. All right. I'm glad the excitement levels are up. They should be up. Because actually, this session is probably going to be the, the best like learning experience of your whole life, all right? Because after the end of this session, you'll probably, you are going to be a changed person and probably for the better, all right? Okay, that's, that's very important to mention. All right, now, I've been doing a little bit of a build-up here, right? Because I've been telling you about how important this creative thinking stuff is, but it's not just me. All right, now two very significant studies came out in the last 18 months or so. Now these, one of the, both of these actually were pre-COVID, which is interesting. One of the studies was by LinkedIn and LinkedIn, what they did is they went around, they interviewed about 1500 CEOs from around the world and they asked them, what do you see as the most essential skills for individuals to thrive in the future of work? Okay. Then what we also saw was a study that came out from the World Economic Forum, and that was about the future of work. So what did these two studies have in common? Well, what they had in common was they talked about some very, very important abilities, skills that you will need to thrive in the future. Now, the first thing they talked about was the fact that, you know, people who are entrepreneurial, who are innovative, who are going to do stuff with digitalization, they need to have a passion, right? Now, when you hear Elon Musk talking, you know, when, 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 when you hear the, the innovators talking about the future, they don't, they, it's not boring for them, right? It's about changing things. Um, a very good friend of mine, actually, a guy called Peter Barber, um, he is actually living in Singapore, another Australian. He's an innovator in the space of rooftop farming, right? Whenever I talk to Peter, he's passionate about what he does. These two reports talked about that, that need for drive. But the other thing they talked about, of course, is that you know, passion is not enough. You actually need to know some things. And what these reports talked about was the fact that in the future of this digital world, what you will need to do is keep yourself up to date, right? So for example, you know, the LinkedIn study, it looked at what are the most essential kind of hard skills. And what they saw there was that the, the skills that were most in demand were skills related to things like artificial intelligence, you know, cloud computing, um, uh, big data, all right. So that's very important when you think about your educational and lifelong educational path to be keeping up to date. All right. That was important. However, what's interesting as well is if we think about in the world of business over the last, I don't know, 150 years, these two things have always been key to entrepreneurs. Right. They've always been key. So in some way, you could say these things aren't changing. It's just that what you need to learn is changing when we talk about stuff like AI. However, right. But however, there was something else 
that was different in these two studies. And what was different? Both of these studies pointed to a new, a new need. And that need was the ability to think creatively. Now, interesting enough, when LinkedIn looked at the most in-demand jobs in the world that had the biggest gap in terms of supply of labor and demand, what were those roles? Those roles were the ones requiring creative thinking. Okay, the ability to really think creatively, to develop new and innovative approaches to problems. Okay, and now when we talk about creativity, don't get me wrong, all right, this is not just about, you know, people when they hear the word creativity, they think art and music. No, in the business world, when we use the word creativity, fundamentally what we're talking about is bringing new and novel approaches to business problems. All right, that's what we think about mostly when we talk about creativity in the business world. Now, what did the World Economic Forum report conclude? Very impressively, the World Economic Forum concluded that creativity is the single most important skill in the world for business professionals to master. Okay, so important. All right. Now, here's the thing that we want to talk about here. All right, is that I'm going to ask you a question now. All right. So I've talked to you about the LinkedIn re report. I talked to you about the World Economic Forum report. And my question to you is this. We're going to launch a poll now. And what I want you to do is answer that poll. And here is the poll question. On a scale of one to five, indicate the degree to which you think you are a creative thinker. Where five is very creative and one is not creative. Or we're actually going to launch that poll. Can we launch the poll now for everyone, please? I'm going to launch the poll. I'm just going to stop the share for a moment. All right, here's the poll now, folks. Can you please enter your response in the polls? Wow, that's great. I see lots of responses. You've got excellent. They're all coming in. Excellent. Keep entering those responses in, folks. Okay, good. Excellent. Now, I was watching the chat box. Some people were putting their numbers in the chat box, and there were lots of, lots of ones, twos, a few fours. Good. Okay, very good. So let's, can we now share the results, please? We're going to end the polling and let's share the results. Okay, let's just have a look there. All right, interestingly. Okay, now what do we see? It's very interestingly. Here with, with you as a group, um, only around 30% of you say, yep, I'm a pretty creative person. Almost 70% of you say, no, you know, creativity is not really my strength. So let me now ask you a second question, right? Let me ask you a second question. So now can we please launch that second poll, please? And what we want to do now is we want to launch the second poll. Now, the second poll, there's a slightly different question because what I want to do with the second poll is I want to ask you this question. Okay, let's go into that one. So on a scale of one to five, please indicate the degree to which you think that the ability to think creatively will be important to help you thrive in that future digital world. Let's go. Let's hear your responses now. Wow, I see them coming in and there's a pretty clear trend there. Figures are coming in. Excellent. All right, folks, keep bringing those responses in. Good. Okay. I think we got pretty much all the responses now. Okay. Can we please share the results now? Let's end the polling there and let's share the result, please. All right. Amazing. So if we look at this, what do we see? We're seeing here that almost, well, pretty much over 90% of you say that the ability to think creatively will be essential for my future. So what's the problem, folks? We have a disconnect. While so many of you recognize the importance of the ability to think creatively, the majority of you think that you are not a creative thinker. So we've got a problem. We've got a gap. Okay, we've got a gap. So here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. And this is what I really promise you now for the remainder of this session, because what we're going to do is we're going to address that gap. And what I'm going to promise you is in the next now 60 minutes or so, we're going to give you the keys. We're going to give you the keys to the lock to your inner potential for creative thinking. All right. I promise you that. And that is going to be stuff that you can implement, you can act upon very quickly. However, we're not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to do that by just talking, all right, lecturing or anything like that. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do that by giving you a whole bunch of exercise experiments to test your creative thinking ability and also to improve it. So are you ready now 
to jump into action. So what you now need is you now need um, beside you, you know, you need a pen. And also we sent to you in advance of this session, a little handout, which is a piece of paper with circles on it. All right. So what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to take this piece of paper. Okay. This piece of paper, this one with the circles on it. And what I'd like you to do now is I would like all of you to start filling out those circles. All right. Now, if you don't have a printout, it's okay. Just on a piece of paper, draw some rows of circles. So what I want you to do now is start filling up those circles. Let's go. And then when you have finished filling up the circles, I want you to type into the chat box, finished, okay, or done, whatever you like, but finished, done, that's good. So let's go. Let's start filling up those circles. And I'm going to watch the chat box to see who's first. Let's see who finishes this task first. Let's go, folks. Start filling up those circles, please. Fill them all up. Right. Let's have a look. Let's go. Come on, folks. Start filling up those circles. Good. Let's go. Let's go. Done. Wow. That's great. Juliana's done. Serena's done. Cindy is done. Jane is done. Keep going, folks. Keep filling up all of those circles. Let's go. There's no questions. Oh, okay. Adeline's saying filling the circles with what? Just whatever you want to fill the circles with, Adeline, you do it. Richard, just do it. As, as, as the, you know, the, what do you call it? The Nike logo says, just do it. Just do it. Fill up those circles. Come on, Richard, do it. Let's go. Okay, Veronica's done. Ada's done. Lee's done. Stella's done. Yvonne's done. You are like, you are like circle filling ninjas here. You're going like crazy. You're going so, this is great. Okay. Keep going, folks. I'm going to give you a little bit more time. Okay. Uh, I can't feel anything. Come on, Kia. You can do it. All right. Good. Pearl is done. Vero's done. Wow, come on, keep going. Just give you a little bit more time. Now, for, I wonder actually, I wonder some of you might still be going. Some of you might be like drawing or something like that. That's also okay because I didn't give you a time limit. But what I'm seeing is that a lot of people are finished. All right. So if you are still drawing, it's okay. Please continue. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to debrief a little bit because what I've actually just done here, okay, what I've actually done is with this circles exercise, I have given you an exercise in complexity. Because what is digitalization all about? It's all about complexity. Because these digital technologies really enable us to do things in fundamentally new and different ways. And that requires us to think about how can we apply those technologies in new ways. So what I've actually given you is a psychological test which tests your cognitive preference when faced with a complex and ambiguous task. And what happens here is immediately when you receive that task, your brain jumps into action and it typically goes one in one of two directions, all right? One of those directions can be what we call convergent thinking, narrow thinking, where you very quickly go to one right answer solution. I'll come back to that in a moment. However, that kind of thinking, that convergent or what we call linear thinking is not the kind of thinking we need to thrive in a complex digital world. The kind of thinking we need for that, the kind of thinking that the World Economic Forum was talking about, the LinkedIn study, is creative thinking. And in that case, what we need is what we call divergent or nonlinear thinking. Okay, where we open up to possibilities, where we open up to ideas. So let's go back to that circles chart for a moment, all right? And have a think about this for a moment because what I want you to reflect upon is how did you fill out those circles? Did you fill out those circles like that? Okay, have a look at your circles, folks. Because if you filled out your circles like that, that is very linear. That is not creative at all. That's like a zombie, zoom, brrr, no brain switched on very linear. All right. Some of you might have even done this. Okay. You might have actually done your circles with just dot, 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 or one, two, three, four, five, six, or A, B, C, D. This is also very linear. This is not the kind of thinking that's going to help you thrive in complex situations. All right. Requiring creativity. All right. Now I'm just going to have a look at a quick Q&A here because I guess people are like, there could be some interesting responses. Okay. Okay. Someone's saying is there, would I agree that there are some people who cannot open at all this potential for creativity? Okay. Look, if you're in a coma, yes. 
You know, if you're on a life support system, if you're like, you know, like a zombie or something like that, yes, you probably can't be very creative. But for the most of us, if you're not a zombie and you're not on a life support system, there's probably the potential to tap into that creativity, all right? I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to that. I'm just looking at the, uh, looking at the chat box here as well. Um, okay. Some people say, well, I didn't fill up the circles because I had too many questions and you didn't answer my question. So it's your fault, Jamie. Okay. Look, look, I think that was Mike. Mike, grow up. Mike, grow up, Mike. All right. Take responsibility. Be an adult. All right. Don't blame me. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't my fault. Okay. So here's the thing, folks. All right. Now, what happens when you give this kind of an exercise to a child? Right. Because I gave this exercise. I test these exercises on my kids. You know, when we have birthday parties at my house with my children, you know, most parents, they hire, a, I don't know, like a jumping castle or they play past the parcel. I do psychological tests on the children during the birthday parties. That's what I do as a professor, right? So I gave this exercise to my children when I discovered it about four or five years ago in the literature. And this is what my daughter, Hannah, did. Now, at the time, Hannah was, was nine years old, all right? What do you see here, folks? You don't see the zombie, uh, 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 one, two, three. You see real creativity because Hannah filled this out with something different in every circle. Why didn't you do that? Okay. What, what's, now, let me explain this. Now, also, I should say, folks, please don't feel depressed. All right. Don't feel depressed because, you know, oh, that's good. Good. Joel is saying that he put some smileys in there. That's good, Joel, unless you did row after row of smiley, all right? If you did lots of smileys, that's still pretty linear, but good for you, Joe. If it makes you happy, good for you. All right. So the thing about this, right, is that when we actually look at the research, if we look at the research on, the, the, on, on creative thinking abilities, it's really amazing because the the, the research, the developmental psychology research shows that 98%, do you believe it? 98% of children under the age of six, and particularly this age when we can test them, four to six, where they have the motor skills to hold the pencils and do these exercises, 98% of those children are divergent thinkers. They're creative thinkers, right? But then what happens is pretty scary, right? Because then what happens is that as children age, they're de their creativity declines. So by the age of 13, only 33% of children are still by default divergent thinkers. That's 13 years old. Then what happens? By the age of 18, that ability for divergent thinking has declined to, wait for it, 10%, just 10%. Okay, now here's my quiz, quiz question for you folks. Enter your, enter your responses in the chat box. What do you think if we, if we test the average adult, someone you know, like 35 years old, most people I think in Singapore are an adult by the time they're 35, okay, I would hope so. Like here in Australia, 35, you consider an adult. So please type in the chat box, what percentage of 35 year olds do you think still have this ability for divergent thinking? What do you think? Okay, 26% Joel, no way too high. Loreen, 5% still, yes. Okay, Charlene wins it. Charlene wins, wins, wins the prize. Okay, what is the prize? A kiss from Jamie, okay? Kiss to you for the, it was 2%. It's 2%. So we go from 98% of, of like the six-year-olds being divergent thinkers to by the time we're adults, it's only 2%. And this is exactly why the World Economic Forum, LinkedIn, they say we've got a crisis in the world. The crisis is not the pandemic. No, that's not the crisis. The crisis is the lack of people who can think creatively on how to deal with the pandemic, how to deal with digitalization, how to respond to the demands for sustainability. That's the crisis, right? And that's what we need to do. We need to unleash that creative potential and we're going to do it for you, all right? So like I said, don't be depressed if you did the straight lines, all right? Now, here's the first thing, all right? What we're going to do now is we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of it, okay? We're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the how to. How do you tap into your creative potential? Because you have to remember, right? Now, this is very important. None of you people skipped childhood, right? Every single one of you at one point in your life were like a six-year-old, right? None, none of you were like produced in some test tube lab or something and popped out into the world at age 35, 30, 25. No, you were six once. That means you were creative once, 
right? So it's just about bringing it out again. It's not about creating it as such, inventing it for you. It's in there. So here's my first golden piece of advice to you, okay? If you want to tap into this creative thinking ability that's in there, then what you need to do actually is you need to think. Now, now I, I know that sounds like a kind of strange advice or simplistic advice, but it's not simplistic at all. Because here's the thing. When most of you did that exercise, okay, you did it really fast. Now, it's interesting. Peng, Peng is saying that, that, Jamie, you said to fill it up fast. No, 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 no. I didn't say fill it up fast. Okay, I was saying, oh, some people have finished. Some people have finished. But I didn't say do it fast. In fact, I didn't put any time limit on that exercise. But most of you assumed that there was time pressure. And you know what we say in Australia, if you assume, you can divide those words up and it says something, okay? You don't want to do that. But here's the thing. What you didn't do was think deeply. You actually rushed into the exercise. And when we rush, when we hurry, we don't think. So what is actually required here, what is required is something called deep work. When you want to think about how can you apply new technologies, how can you apply new approaches to problems, you need to take time to think about that. And when I say take time, is the research shows that to trigger your brain into deep thinking, to actually open up the synapses, to have those neurons firing in your brain and connecting the different regions of your brain where your memories are stored, your education is stored, your experiences are stored, your, your neural networks need to fire and be connected. And that takes about somewhere between 14 and 20 minutes to really activate, all right, to get into that deep work mode. So, what some people talk about is like the Pomodoro method, right? The Pomodoro method is about 20 minutes because that's how long you should cook your Pomodoro tomatoes, all right, the Italians. It should be 20 minutes of deep thinking. However, what's the problem, folks? What's the problem in today's world? Well, the research shows that the average knowledge worker is distracted every six minutes, every six minutes. So some of you, I guarantee it, during this session, here you are with Jamie, I'm sharing like, like this wisdom and incredible information and knowledge with you, but some of you have probably been looking at this thing during this session. You've been distracted. And every time you check this thing, your mind actually clicks out of what Jamie is saying and the, the, the making sense of that in your brain to Instagram or whatever it might be. So here is my question for you folks. I want you to type into the chat box. What are your biggest distractions? What are the things that actually prevent you from taking that at least 20 minutes to think deeply about how you can solve problems, how you can do things in new and novel ways? Let's go. I'm going to look at the chat box now. I want to hear you about your distractions. So let's have a look. Okay, let's have a look what people are saying here. Oh, great. Interesting. Okay, let's go. Exactly. A lot of people, so many people are talking about this thing, this thing should not be called a smartphone. This thing should be called a weapon of mass distraction because that's what it does to us. It distracts us, all right? So it's notifications. And by the way, it's these apps. Behind these apps are psychologists, neuroscientists. And what are they doing? They're messing with our brains because they know how to design an experience to actually distract you and lock you in to that engagement with that device, all right? So a lot of people are talking about, oh, thank you, A is talking about children. I don't know about you folks, but it's a nightmare. Like being at home during the COVID crisis, it's a nightmare. I have three children. It's like being in, in the worst open plan office you can ever imagine because our house is like an open plan office. I've got my son, Charlie, my daughter, Hannah, my son, Reese, and they come up to me during the day and they say, Papa, we want a hug. I say to them, listen, it's, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. I've got work to do. I'll give you a hug tonight. Go away. You know, it's really, really, it's crazy, right? So working at home, you have the distractions of children. Come on, let's have a look. I want to hear. Yeah, exactly. Jeff is talking about domestic matters, you know, trying to keep the house clean, cooking, everything. You can't have household help come if you do have household help because of Corona. I've got lots of friends in India as well. And these Indian people, 
They normally never do anything. You know, middle-class Indians, they don't do anything. They don't cook, they don't clean, they don't wash, they have helpers. But during COVID, they can't have help at home. So they have to do all that stuff. That's a big distraction. So a lot of people are talking here about the distractions of just keeping our household going, family, these devices, big distractions. All right, now there's other things here. Also, it's interesting um, because there's another whole bucket of distractions here, which is not about other people. And it's not about the devices. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking if anyone's mentioned it in the chat. Come on, what else distracts us besides other people distracting us? I'm having, yeah, conspiracy theories. That's a good one. I like that one. People talking in a loud voice. This is really the, the work environment. I still haven't seen the other one yet. Lack of sleep. That's a good one. We'll come back to that one. Thank, thanks for that. That's a really, that's a really good insight. Um, that, that came from, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, here's the thing that I didn't see there yet. The psychologists actually call it self-distraction, all right? What is self-distraction? It's when, when we are mind-wandering. So even though we should be focused on, on these ideas and brainstorming and thinking, we keep wandering off and thinking about other things, all right? So we have to be aware of that. All right, folks, here's what I want you to do now. You're aware of these distractions, right? We're all aware of these distractions. So what I'd like you to do now is I want you to type into the chat box, what are the most effective tactics that we can use to manage distractions? So if your biggest distraction is this device, okay? It's the WhatsApp, it's the YouTube, it's the Instagram, Facebook. Facebook is evil when it comes to distraction because what does it do? If you haven't seen it yet, watch the Netflix documentary, The Social Network. This is scarier because you know what they do at Facebook? If you haven't logged into Facebook for a while, you haven't checked your Facebook, they use all of their analytical data on what really, really matters to you. And then they send you a few little reminders, a few little, little emails to say, your best friend, that attractive guy that you've been watching a lot lately, he just posted on Facebook. All right, they do that to you. All right, type in, please, folks. What do you do? Yes, and um, here you mentioned Deep Work is actually a book by Cal Newport. Please read it. It's excellent. Cal Newport's book goes right into not only why deep work is important, but also the tactics you can use to do it better. But let's hear from you. Okay, let's hear what, 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 is, what is working for you. I'm looking at the chat box now. What works for you to manage your distractions? All right, let's have a look. Switching off the phone, very simple one. Even better, I bought my kids, we have a safe, you know, like a lockable safe with a digital thing on it, lockable safe. Um, actually, you know, one of the things that's really good for deep work is just like said here, isolation. You know, what I did is I, 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 I left home, I ran away from home, okay, during COVID-19, during nine to five, what did I do? I rented a small little, uh, office in a co-working space around the corner from where I live. That's where I go to work during the day now. All right. Some people flee to a Starbucks, you know, when they're open. So you need a place to go where you can get away from all those distractions, the noises, the people and stuff like that. All right. Um, take a holiday. That's a great way. What did Bill Gates do? When he was CEO of Microsoft every year, Bill Gates would take five days in complete isolation. He would take kind of this holiday where he would go away alone to be in his own thoughts, to think, to reflect without distractions. Right? And he talked about how critical that was to helping him um, as a CEO. Um, very good, you know, like, like reading books instead of short articles. Exactly. Getting your brain back in the habit of longer bouts of concentration. All right. Um, this is excellent. I really see some great advice here. Now, the interesting thing that's striking me about this is that, you know, most of you know this stuff, right? Most of you know what you should be doing, but you're not. So the key here, and this is what Cal Newport talks about, it's also about having discipline. All right. So a few very simple reflections from all of your feedback. Number one, find yourself a workspace, a workspace that you can go to where you will not be distracted. All right. Now that can be, as I said, a little space you create at home, a co-working space. I was um, before the COVID pandemic. I was in India. I visited the Nokia Software Development Center in Bangalore, and they really understand this. So at the Nokia Software Development Center in Bangalore, they have pods, work pods, where you can go as as one of their employees. You can go there to be really alone. These little solo pods. What they also provide at 
in, in, in Nokia is they provide noise cancelling headphones. Very powerful, right? So when you see one of your colleagues with noise cancelling headphones, that is a signal this person is in deep work mode. Don't distract them. Okay, um, so you just need to think about these tactics and certainly you need better tactics for this thing. All right, because if you're not giving yourself this focus time, you're not going to get the benefits. All right, so let's move on, folks. Let's move on. Just to check in with you, I'd really like to hear how is it? How, how is the session so far? Can you please just type in the chat box? How do you find the session so far? Um, is it, am I speaking too fast for anyone? Is the humor okay? I haven't. I hope I haven't upset anybody. Very good, thanks. A lot of good feedback. Fabulous. Oh, I love that. That's for, oh, great. Engaging. Good energy. Excellent. I'm speaking a bit too fast. I'll slow that down for some people. All right. Okay. I, I do get excited because I'm so passionate about creativity and creative thinking. And sometimes even, I'm sorry, sometimes stuff flies out. Okay. If it does fly out, please don't be offended. It's just my passion for this topic. All right, so here's what we're going to do now. I want us to move on. So we've talked about, we've talked about the importance of deep work, of focus. All right, so here's now your next exercise. All right, we talk, 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 but let's now do another exercise. So here's what I'd like you to do now. Now in this exercise, unlike the first one, I'm going to give you a strict 30 second time limit. All right, I'm trying to slow down a bit. I'm trying. I'm taking a deep breath. Okay. I'm going to give you a strict 30 second time limit. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In that 30 seconds, what you're going to do is you're going to create a cake. And then you're going to cut the cake four times, right? You're going to create cakes. You're going to cut those cakes four times. And the objective in creating these cakes and cutting them four times is to come up with the maximum number of pieces of cake possible. However, there is a strict 30 second time limit. So come on folks, let's go. Start creating those cakes, cutting them four times and coming up with as many pieces as possible. When you are finished, please put the number of pieces that you've created in the chat box. Let's go, let's go. I'm watching, I'm watching, let's go. I'm putting my timer on now. Clock, stopwatch. Let's go. Okay, you've got 20 seconds left. All right, I'm watching the chat box now. Let's see who's done. Okay, eight pieces from Veronica, 12 pieces from Janice. Jeremiah's got six, Bernice has got, Peg has got 12, Jess has got eight. Ooh, Mike's got 12. Come on, Mike, come on. Nin's got, Sybil's got nine. Lily's got, Sarita's got 10. Okay, come on, folks, you've got 10 seconds to go. Let's go, come on, let's do it. 10 seconds to go. Let's go. I'm looking at the chat box. 18 pieces. Oh, Kim Song's got 50. Come on, keep going, folks. You got five seconds to go. Five seconds. Cindy's got nine. Oh, oh that's a oh, hang on a second. Oh, Lee howell has got 28,830. Please stop. Please stop. Lee Howe got he got 28,830 pieces. What a legend! That's incredible. It's a bit better than eight. A bit better than eight. All right, here. Now let's now talk about what happened here all right because folks what have we been talking about for the last 35 minutes what we've been talking about the last 35 minutes is thinking creatively right now what i've just given you is another exercise in complexity right now here's something i want to tell you about digital is just a tool all right it's a tool just like a knife to cut a cake is a tool all right Digital is just a tool. It's just, you know, it can be an object. It can be a computer. It can be, you know, a piece of software code, but just like a cake can be an object, right? So what I've actually did in this exercise, although I'm not using digital, I'm using a cake and a knife. Actually, there is a very strong parallel here because what this exercise is fundamentally about is thinking creatively about coming up with as many pieces as possible. And let me tell you, if you came up with eight pieces, that is a disaster. That is so suboptimal. In fact, eight pieces, 12 people, 16 pieces, even 36 pieces. That is so suboptimal. You can do so much better, but you need to think, which is what many of you did not do. Okay, so here's my question for you folks, okay? Here's my question for you. Have a look at this for a moment, right? 
I guarantee you that many of you did your cake like this. All right. Now, again, I've, I've given this exercise to thousands of people all over the world at the World Creativity Forum, in online events, in conferences. This is the most common circle drawn. Don't feel bad if you did it, but it's absolutely so suboptimal that it's almost embarrassing. All right. Now, some of you might have done a cake like that. Still very poor because it's suboptimal. You can get thousands of pieces. I guarantee I'll show you in a little while. Now, if you did this one, okay, now you there's five cuts. But also if you did this one, maybe you should talk to me offline later because that's actually an inverted pentagon, which is a satanic symbol. All right, if you did that one, maybe you got something else going on in your life. Now, some of you might have done that one. Ooh, three-dimensional cake. But it can still be so much better. Now, here's the thing, folks. Here's what I want you to type into the chat box now. Okay, here's what I want you to in the chat box. What assumptions did you make about this exercise? What assumptions did you make about the cake? And what assumptions did you make about the knife? Let's go. Please type in the chat box. I'm watching now. Yes, absolutely. Right. Shuan's saying, David's saying that it should be a circular cake. Like, like cakes come in all different shapes and sizes. They're not just round. Absolutely right. Okay, some people are saying everyone has to get an equal size piece. Oh, Hashina is saying a linear knife. Yes, Hashina, because a knife could have a hundred blades. It could be an industrial knife in a, in a bakery or something like that. It could be, my kids, my kids love Star Wars. It could be a laser, like a laser sword. All right. Um, you see, so you made all these assumptions about the shape of the cake, about the knife and so on. Now, the other interesting thing here, of course, is that some people, yeah, exactly, Joel. I love the lightsabers, man. I love it. I love it. Hey, Hardeep, don't feel bad, mate. Don't feel bad. Like Hardeep saying, like, I feel like an idiot. No, don't worry, mate. You're not. Because what I just show you here, when I actually, I presented at the World Creativity Forum a couple of years ago, and I did this exercise, in the audience were 4,000 of probably the most creative people in the world. That's why they went there. 85% of those people did cakes like this. Now, how do I know that? Because I collected their papers afterwards in boxes at the door and I analyzed them with my research assistant. So don't feel like an idiot. This is, this is going back to what we talked about earlier. Only 2% of adults still have this ability to think creatively by default. All right. So here's the thing. Okay. Now, look, look it's very interesting here. Everyone's putting these assumptions. Now, by the way, you also made assumptions about the process. Because when I look over there, all right, when I look over there, I didn't see anyone put questions in the Q&A box about Jamie, what do you mean by maximum number of pieces? I didn't say here anyone asked me a question, Jamie, does the cake have to be round? All right. So that's also interesting. You assume that you couldn't ask questions. You know, you could have in the chat box, you could have been chatting there saying, oh, what do other people think? How about we do it like that? Nobody put in the chat box. Okay, so very interesting. Raphael saying that he got to a million. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that one. It's possible, all right. It's possible. Now, here's the thing, folks. What I want you to do now, and I want to hear you in the chat box now. The question is not so much that you made these assumptions. You made them, right? Here is my question for you now. Where did these assumptions come from, right? So my question for you actually is, what has life done to you? to mess you up, right? And now, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say mess you up in total. I'm saying, what has life done to you to kill your creativity? Let's hear from you. Okay, excellent. So people are talking about their upbringing. People are talking about the subconscious mind, culture, you know, math, yes, math. Because in the education system in Singapore, you have a hierarchy of subjects. And Singapore has an education system which was designed to help people thrive in an industrial age economy. Math at the top, then the hard sciences, you know, the chemistry, the physics, all that stuff, then the, the languages, and way down the bottom, creativity. You know, in Singapore, if you want your kids to be creative, it happens after school time, right? In addition to all of the homework. So education is a big one. And around the world today, many countries are reforming their education systems to bring in more creativity. 
All right. It's essential. India is doing that right now. Scandinavia has already done it. The UK is working on it. So here's the question here, right? Is this because, oh, actually, sorry, if you haven't seen it, the most watched TED talk in history, okay, the most watched TED talk in history um, is by a guy called Sir Ken Robinson. And that TED talk is called Do Schools Kill Creativity? The late Ken Robinson. Now, tragically, he passed away last year. If you haven't seen it, please go and watch that TED talk, Do Schools Kill Creativity? And what Ken Robinson talks about is the way that the modern education system was designed for that industrial, linear world and how it is now inadequate, okay? All right, so, okay, now here's the one. So education is one of the reasons. Come on, what's some other reasons that you didn't think? Okay, what's another reason that you did a round cake with straight lines? What's another reason for that? Come on, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Come on, I'm seeing people are saying, yeah, if afraid of failure, you'll come back to that one. Come on, folks, I can't believe nobody's saying it yet. Yeah, yeah, cake shops. Okay, why do we do equal size pieces? That's a great comment. Because that's the way we always cut cakes. Equal size pieces. I mean, let me show you. Let me show you this for a second. Because if I go back to those cakes, right? If you look at these cakes, they reveal a lot, right? The top left cake, right? When I work in Sweden or Scandinavia, all the Swedish people, they do the top left cake. Why? Because they're socialist and everybody should get the same size piece. You see that cake in the middle at the top? I call that the Donald Trump cake, right? Because you see in the middle cake, there's one piece which is much bigger than all the other pieces. That's America first, make America great again, you know? That's the American cake. The top right one, we talk about the satanic stuff. Well, actually, when I gave this exercise in Finland, I saw a couple of guys draw that. I was a bit freaked out. What, what is going on in Finland? You know, Satan worship? No. As it turns out, that is also the symbol for heavy metal inverted pentagon. And in Finland, people love heavy metal. So a few of them drew that one. All right. So there's something interesting here. There's the influence of culture, the interest, influence of education. There's the influence of experience. But of course, there's something else. And I still can't believe I don't see it. Come on, folks. Why else? Okay, let me then give you a hint. Who made you draw the cakes in this way? Who did it to you? It was me. All right. I, yes, thank you, Jeremiah. Jeremiah said it was you, Jamie. You made me do it. Jeremiah, grow up. Okay, don't blame other people for your issues and problems. No, I'm, I'm, you're right, Jeremiah. It was me. Because what I did is I was saying, create a cake and cut them four times. So what I was doing was influencing you. That is called leadership. That is called peer pressure. That is called following the status quo. Right, so this is super important. Yes, thank you. Mandy's saying social norms and expectations. Right now, if you're in a highly, you know, what do you call it? Um, consensus driven culture where people don't like to stand out. I'm not going to name any specific nations here, but you know, that can become an issue that people are afraid to be different to what other people are doing and they follow the rules too much. I was setting the rules. All right, now here's the important thing. All right, here's the important thing. If we actually throw away all of those assumptions, right? So the line is not straight. The line is a zigzag or the line is a complete mess or the line is a spiral. How many pieces of cake do we get now, folks? Thousands of pieces in 30 seconds. Okay, now this is exactly when I gave this exercise to my children, the one who did it the best was my youngest son, Charlie. At the time, he was seven years old. That's what he did. He came to show it to me. And what do you think his big brother Reese said? His big brother Reese, who's 13, he looked at Charlie and said, Charlie, that's not allowed. You see? Because Reese at 13 has been to school. He started to learn there's a rules and behaviors and you can't be out of the ordinary. That's an issue for us, okay? Or I'm just going to have a look at the chat box. Great. Thank you so much. I'm loving the interaction, folks. I'm really loving the interactions. Thank you. Um, Yadip's talking about not taking risk. Um, yeah, Raphael said, you'll never look at a cake the same way again. <laughs> oh, yeah, Chua's saying, I don't want to eat this cake. Chua, please do not try this at a kid's birthday party, all right? If you cut a cake like this at a kid's birthday party, the kids are going to kill you, all right? Because at my kid's birthday parties, 
they measure it with a measuring ruler to make sure everyone gets the same size piece. Okay. Now, of course, the other thing that I should mention here, and it goes back to the deep work topic, is that the other reason that most of us did not think during this exercise was because of time pressure. When the research shows that when we are under intense time pressure, we stop thinking. We trigger the linear thinking part of the brain, all right? Because we feel pressure, we feel fear, we have to perform. However, what the research also shows is that it's not just, it's not so much about the time pressure, it's actually about how you frame that time. Because what I said to you during the exercise was all about urgency, it was all about pushing you. However, what I did say to you is create cakes. Please type into the chat box, how many cakes did you actually create in 30 seconds? How many? Because I said cakes many times. Yep, Cindy says one cake. Yep, I see it here, lots of people. Yep, Giselle, Sarange, one cake. But I repeatedly said cakes. You see, there is no one right answer to a complex problem. That's the first thing. The second thing is, the worst thing you can do to people is go to them, give them a complex problem and say, give me an answer within 30 seconds or even three hours. Because what that will do is force them towards linear thinking, defaulting to their education, their experience, what they did before. However, what if I had said to you during that exercise, I want you to draw at least five cakes in this 30 seconds. And within that 30 seconds, those five cakes should be all different and each one of them should have more pieces than the last. I guarantee you, because I've tested it, you would actually get to the creative solution even within the constraints of the 30 seconds. So it's not so much about the time available, it's how you frame that time for people and encourage them to push towards divergent thinking rather than convergent. All right, here's what we're gonna do, folks. Um, we're almost, we're, we're, we're about, we're, we're, we've got about 40 minutes left to go. It's a long session. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to have a little break. Okay, we're gonna have a little break, literally just five minute break. And what I would like you to do during that break is reflect, okay? And what I would like you to reflect upon is everything that we've heard up until now. And for you personally, I want you to reflect upon what are your biggest blockers to creativity for you personally? Is your blocker one of these? That it, you're just too distracted all the time, you're not giving yourself time? Or maybe your blocker is fear of looking foolish or, or, or being different, but you think about that for yourselves. Okay, folks, so literally now we're gonna have a five minute break. So we're gonna put up some information about some of the great stuff happening um, with Smart Nation. And while we're doing that, you can have your tea, you can have a little toilet stop, and I'll see you in five minutes from now. See you soon, folks.
Okay, folks, we're starting back in one minute. Welcome back. Welcome back into the session in one minute. Okay, welcome back. And thanks to everyone for the wonderful comments and, and questions. I've just been scanning through those during the break. So there were several questions um, and comments um, about uh, the topic of like, well, sh we, should we be creative all of the time? Of course not. Okay. Now, here's the thing that's very, very important, folks, um, is that when we talk about creative thinking, right, there is a need for creative th thinking in certain situations. And in any situation in life, in work, in business, there are different scenarios that we walk into. Now, some scenarios are very simple. Cause and effect is really obvious. We've done it a thousand times before. We know that the processes and procedures are there. So you don't need to get everyone around brainstorming and thinking about how to fix those kind of problems because they're easy, all right? But then you move into more complicated, then you move into more complex questions. And when you start moving more and more into complicated and complex kind of problems, then we need more and more creative thinking, okay? Because the way we've done it in the past is not gonna help us to solve the things that we need to address in the future, right? So that's the first thing, you know? Like I, I was approached a few years ago by an organization in Russia, believe it or not, and they wanted me to go to Russia and they wanted me to run like this creative thinking workshop. And, and they wanted me to work with their engineers, you know, Russian engineers on being more creative and thinking out of the box and going crazy, you know, with, with all this, this creative and innovation. And then I got to know a little bit about the client. And as it turned out, this client was a company called Rosatom. You know, have you guys heard of Rosatom? Ever, ever heard of Rosatom? The Rosatom is the Russian Atomic Energy Agency, okay? You know, and I said to these people, no, no, you know, I'm not going to come to Russia and teach your, you know, atomic engineers how to think outside the box and stuff. No, you keep those people inside the box, all right? Because you don't want people going to a nuclear power plant and saying, I wonder what the red button does, you know, boom, you know, the whole thing blows up. No, all right? So the other thing to understand here, is that in certain businesses, in certain areas of life, there are rules, there are laws, there are regulations, there is compliance. So the other thing to be aware of is that creativity and the application of creative thinking has to happen within boundaries, all right? However, once you're aware of those boundaries, those limits, those rules, those policies, those regulations, then you should give people freedom to play within the canvas. Okay, so I hope that answers that question about should we be creative all the time? The answer is, of course, not. Okay. Um, and the other thing, as I said, creativity should always be happening within boundaries, because if you don't set some boundaries, then what can happen? Big problems. All right. Now, the other organization that I run some creative thinking workshops for many years ago was a very large German bank. And I work with their global tax advisors on creative thinking. Okay. Global tax advisors at a bank. I worked with them on creative thinking. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that because most of those people are in jail now, okay? Now, don't tell anybody I told you that, all right? But don't get too creative when it comes to taxes, all right? You're going to get into trouble, all right? In Singapore, don't get creative with taxes. Okay, good. Filling out your tax returns. Hope that also makes sense. I'm glad that Carbon has heard of uh, Rosatom. All right, so... Fantastic. So keep those questions coming. Uh, keep those comments coming. I'm going to be checking those as we go along. So let's move on, folks. So what I want to do now um, is I just want to debrief a little bit because we had this long discussion and I asked you to reflect upon what are your biggest blockers to the ability to think creatively. Now, here's what the research shows. Us, okay, what are the biggest blockers? Well, the biggest blockers, of course, are learning habit. We talked about education, but it's also about habit. We just fall into patterns of doing things the way we've done them in the past. There are rules, there are traditions. The other thing that I often hear is people say, we don't have the money, we don't have the time to be creative. In most cases, I say, hang on a second. It's not about the resources we have available. It's about the resourcefulness 
in getting things done in the absence of resources. I gave you the example of the 30 second time limit, right? You could say 30 seconds is not enough time to be creative. It's impossible. We can't get anything done in 30 seconds. Well, guess what? I've tested it. If you frame that 30 seconds properly for people and you encourage them and inspire them towards creativity, they get a lot done in 30 seconds, all right? So next time you're in a situation where one of your colleagues, one of your family members, it says it can't be done because we don't have the time, we don't have the resources. You say, well, how else can we do it? All right? I do this with my children all the time, all right? Whenever they come to me and they ask me something, you know, and they say, Dad, you know, on the weekend, I want to go and have a sleepover and I want to stay at my friend, you know, Kathy's house and we want to have a pillow party and a video. I say, but I'm busy. I've got stuff to do. I say, Hannah, that's completely possible, but you organize it. And then she says, but how am I going to do that? I say, well, I don't know. You come and tell me how you're going to work it out. So one of the other things that I've observed is we, in, as parents, we helicopter parent our children. We do everything for them. In Singapore, goodness me, I've got my friend, friends in Singapore. And they like schedule their kids' lives, you know? And one of the things we need to give kids is unstructured time and we need to give them boredom because when they have unstructured time and boredom, they find things to do and they come up with ideas of how to do those things. Also very important. I've got another, I've actually got a, a keynote talk on creative parenting, a, key, a, a TED talk. I'll, we'll share that with you afterwards. Very important. Okay, so we talk about these things like cultural barriers, perceptual barriers, and also emotional barriers. Now, several of you talked about in the chat box that fear holds me back, right? Fear holds me back. And that is the research shows that fear of looking bad, the fear of looking different is one of the biggest killers of creative thinking. So here's what I'd like you to say. So what I don't want you to do, you see a little picture on the right there? I call that person the corporate zombie. What is a corporate zombie? A corporate zombie is someone who's on autopilot. They're not thinking about the way they're thinking. And all these things on that you see here, all the things that are mentioned are things that you need to be conscious of and reflect upon. But you can only do that if you give that yourself that time. I'm just going to have a look at the chat box because I can see more people putting in some comments uh, and questions. Excellent. Now, please, if you do have questions, folks, please do put those questions in the Q&A box. I'm going to have a look across there now just to catch up um, with where we are. Okay. Um, good. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. So it's interesting because somebody talked about, you know, once cooking creatively and parents scolding them, you know, I'm like, okay, it's massively important that as parents, that we celebrate and encourage creativity. Okay. Now, again, I've been to Singapore a few times. All right. And one of my friends, you know, I overheard them, you know, say to their child who was playing with, I think it was like messing around with Lego. So, you know, your parent, the parents said, do your homework. You know, playing with Lego is not going to get you a good job. And I was kind of blown away by that, you know. And what does the research today show, actually? The research shows that people who thrive in the future have both what is called inventive and expressive creativity. Inventive creativity is the problem solving. The ability to think creatively about solving complex problems. But also... They're people who have a hobby in music, art, dance. If you look at often in real innovators, real creative people, they often have a mix and an over, overlap of both this inventive and expressive creativity. 70% of Nobel Prize winners in the sciences, 70% of them are also accomplished artists or other creative um, minds in some way. Painters, sculptors, photographers, actors, dancers, 70% of Nobel Prize winners have a creative passion or hobby. So in Singapore, folks, please encourage your kids to go for those creative talents. And if you've had one in the past that you've stopped, start doing it again. I have a look at the chat box. I see some, some. Okay, great. All right, let's move on, folks. So here's the next thing we want to go to, right, is this. I want you now to... Take your, if you're near a mirror, that's great. Look in the mirror. If not, take a selfie of yourself, okay? So take your camera. And what I want you to do now is I want you to take a selfie. So I'm going to take a selfie of myself. Here we go. There's my other smile. There's my selfie, all right? So you see my selfie. I just took a selfie of myself. I want you to take a selfie of yourself. And then what I want you to do, I want you to draw a picture, a lifelike picture of yourself within 45 seconds, okay? 
And what we're going to do with that picture, actually, I'm going to invite you to share those pictures with everybody on this call after you draw them. So let's go, folks. Please start uh, drawing those pictures. Let's go. 45 seconds. Now, you should be drawing the full front of the face in lifelike detail, and you should not be drawing in abstract. I don't want to see a picture of, you know, like, an, like a fish or a horse or, you know, something like that. It should be you, the real you with all the beautiful little wrinkles around the eyes, the full lips. In my case, not much hair. Whatever you look like, please draw those pictures. Let's go. Keep drawing. Keep drawing. Now, don't stop drawing, okay? I want you really to draw yourself looking exactly like you would in real life. And as I said, you're going to share those pictures with other people because we're going to ask some of you to switch on your videos to hold up your pictures. Come on, let's go, folks. I'm watching. I'm watching here. I'm watching the time. You've got 30 seconds to go. Sketching, sketching. Let's go. Let's go. Let's draw those pictures. All right. Let's go. Keep drawing. Keep drawing. Now, we should be using your pencil and stuff. Now, it should be almost finished. Now, remember, you need to just do the full face, the eyes, the nose, the lips, if you're smiling, the teeth. Okay, good. Excellent. All right, I think most of you should be done about now. All right. Now, here's what I'd like you to do now. You should be finishing up your pictures of yourself. They're really a sketch, okay, really a sketch. What I want you to do now is once you finish your picture, I want you to have a look at that picture. Then I want you to type into the chat box. If you just took that, that picture, if you took that picture out into the streets of Singapore and you just randomly showed that picture to people without telling them that you drew it, all right? So you just, you just drew your picture, you hold it up to them and say, and this is the question you would ask them. How old do you think the person was who drew this picture? All right, now what I want you to do is I want you to type into the chat box, looking at your picture that you have drawn of yourself, what kind of answer do you think you would get from that person? What age do they think would be the person who drew that picture? Let's go. Please enter it into the chat box. I want you to, to assess your drawing age ability by age. Oh, my goodness. Car is saying six. So, Car, you have the drawing age ability of a six-year-old? That's fantastic. Come on, let's hear from other people. Look at those selfies you've drawn of yourselves and give me your estimates of what people would tell you. Let's go. Type them into the chat box. <laughs> I guess some people are still drawing. Okay, I've got some great questions I'll come to in a second. Okay, come on, 16, all right, that's not too bad, Leah, okay? Come on, I want to hear from the rest of you. Looking at your picture, what age do you think people would guess? Now, let me tell you something here, okay, because this is really interesting. So what does the research actually show? The research shows that the average 30-year-old has the drawing age ability, has the drawing age ability of a six-year-old, okay, a six-year-old. Now, why is that? Because as we talked about earlier, most of us stop being creative somewhere in terms of drawing and stuff like that, somewhere between the ages of six and 13. The, the creativity really drops off. Now, what does the research show? What is the reason for that? One of the big reasons is that we stop being creative because of education, right? We get it taken away from us. But there's another reason. Now, I have given this exercise, okay, this drawing exercise to senior level executives in big international organizations in face-to-face -face workshops. And what I've actually done is I've just, I haven't asked them to draw themselves. I'm asked them to draw the person sitting next to them. And what is the reaction of those, exercise, those executives? Very senior level people. They are terrified. You can't believe the reactions. You can't believe the reactions that, that these people give you when you ask them to draw the person sitting next to them. Now, here's my question to you, and I want you to type in the chat box. Why do you think that very senior level executives are terrified to draw the person sitting next to them in a live workshop? Why would that be? These are very intelligent people, high earning, successful, but they freak out when you ask them to draw a picture. Please type in the chat box. Why do you think that's the case? Let's go. Let's, let's hear from you. Excellent. Great, great. Fast, great feedback. Absolutely. Car is saying the fear of looking silly. 
fear of embarrassment, uh, high, saying no training. They're, they're not skilled at it. They're not good at it. All right. Very true. So here's the thing, right? Now, again, have a look at your picture. Now, I'm not going to ask you to share those pictures because we can't actually, we can't activate your, your video today. But many of you would have felt threatened or afraid that you're going to be embarrassed by me asking you to share that picture. Why? Because it's not very good. So one of the other things that we talk about here, and it's massively, massively underappreciated in this digital economy, that for me, you know, one of the biggest blockers in terms of innovating with digital is not understanding what the technology can do. The biggest fear is going to your colleagues or stepping into your organization and suggesting new ideas, suggesting to do things differently, because that means you might fail. You know, you might try something and it might not work. You might be ridiculed, all right? You might get criticism. So this is very, very important, okay, that we have to, in a way, reconnect also with our creative courage. And what that also means is being in an environment in which creativity is encouraged. If you're a leader, if you're working in a team, do you laugh at your colleagues when they bring new ideas or do you celebrate them and encourage them? All right. Are people who bring ideas in your organization celebrated or criticized? It's super important. Now, the same, by the way, goes in the household. In, with parents and children, but even more so between children. The research shows that between the biggest, now, by the way, the next big drop happens around 13 years old, okay? Now, the research here shows that it's not the education system, it's actually the peer group. So the, when kids really get their creativity going down even further is between 13 and 16 years old, when they're highly sensitive to the perspective of their peers. And therefore, it's also very important, okay, when you hear your children, particularly the older ones, criticizing the younger ones for creativity, you talk to them about that, right? I talk to my older children about what criticizing their little brother's creative tasks, whether it's building some Lego or Play-Doh, what that does to him, it kills his self-confidence. And they don't do that. They're a bit older now, but they, don't, they didn't do that anymore. So we have to be conscious of that as well. Help people to keep that creative passion. Okay, folks, I'm just going to check in with you. I'm just going to check in with you now. I'm looking at the Q&A. Um, and there's an interesting question here. Um, yeah, so there was a question there about, you know, how do you very practically deal with these issues like lack of time and lack of resources? So, so I think this goes back to, to the deep work that I mentioned, okay, is if you feel constrained by lack of time and resources, you need to create the time. And sometimes that does not happen in the office, all right? So here's actually my next question for you. I would like you to type into the chat box now this, an answer to this question. Where are you and what are you doing when you get your best ideas? Let's go. Please type into the chat box. What time of day, what activity are you doing when you get those brilliant flashes of wisdom? Let's go. I'm going to have a look in the chat box now. Let's go. Let's type them in. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Let's have a look. Okay. Excellent. So people, so people say, Jane gets her ideas in the bathroom. Wonderful, Jane. We'll come back to that one. First thing in the morning, walking in the park. Um, during exercise, says Philip. Early in the morning, a lot of people saying in the morning, strolling alone in the park at night, Lorraine. That's wow. Okay. During an evening walk while doing housework. Me too. Sometimes I vacuum. I love it because it gives me time to think. Mowing the lawns. Oh, except my wife, she freaks out when I mow the lawn because I never mow the lawn in a straight line. Whenever I mow the lawn, I do zigzags and spirals and it really freaks my wife out. Okay. All right. Um, Excellent. All right. Look, here's this is wonderful, folks, because what I'm about to share with you now is the cutting edge of research on creative thinking. And the amazing thing is it's not so much about what happens up here. It's about the rest of the body, because what we start to understand is this, that to be a creativity, creative thinking star, it is also about heart. It's about health and well-being. So I'm going to share this little, little piece of research with you. Okay marvelous piece of research. All right. You can Google it. Just Google the healthy mind platter and you will find the full report. This is a cross-disciplinary study 
done by a group of uh, leadership experts, neuroscience, psychologists, and medical doctors looking at what it takes to perform at your cognitive best. And what do we need, folks? We need sleep, okay? Sleep is critical because when you sleep, your body and brain in particular is cleansed. So during the day when we're thinking, 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 our brain is burning a little chemical called dopamine. Okay, dopamine is the neurotransmitter. When you burn dopamine, you create what is called an amylid protein that builds up like plaque on the brain. You need to clear that away. And to clear it away, you need at least seven hours of sleep, ideally eight hours. If you're getting less than six hours sleep, you're really not going to perform at your cognitive best, particularly if that is sustained over time. What else do we need to do? We need to exercise, folks. You know, jump up and down, move. All right, can I ask everyone please to stand up? Can everyone please stand up where you are right now? And what I want you to do is I want to put your hands up in the air like that, okay? Put your hands up in the air. Very important. Power posing. What happens? By standing up, by moving, and your hands in the air, by the way, your body and your brain gets connected. Your brain thinks something's happening. This person's about to exercise, about to move. So the body starts releasing chemicals. All right. Now, when you actually do exercise, especially aerobic exercise, your body releases a chemical called dopamine. Now, I mentioned that just a moment ago. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. So if you're feeling really tired in the evening, you're feeling a bit exhausted after work, go for a jog, go for a swim, go for a bike ride. You see that jersey? That's me. I'm a cyclist, a competitive cyclist. And what happens is your body releases dopamine and that's a neurotransmitter. You feel alert. You feel you you perform better cognitively. All right. So you need to exercise. Now I said aerobic exercise. Why aerobic exercise? You get much more of that endorphin dopamine and also a chemical called brain derived neurotrophic factor when you do aerobic exercise. A few weeks ago, if you Google, go on, go on YouTube, go on YouTube and search Professor Jamie Anderson, biking brain. I gave a talk about the whole physiology of brain performance and exercise. That's online. Okay. The other thing we need is focus time. I'm not going to say too much about that. That's deep work. Already explained it. However, we also need something called time in. Now, what is time in? Time in is doing nothing. It's in the shower, bathroom, or can be on the toilet. Although in today's world, a lot of people take this into the toilet. Don't do it, folks. Don't do it. Okay. It's taking away that in time. So in time is really those moments for reflection, introspection. Some people typed in the chat box, yoga and meditation. That's where my best ideas come. Yes, that's time in because it's time without distractions. The other thing we need is relaxation, downtime, just reading a book, watching a movie, sitting by the pool with a good novel. Why? Because that disengages the frontal cortex. Okay, very important. Now, the other thing we need is playtime. Now, what is playtime here? It can overlap with physical time, but more importantly, it is about creating joy, happiness. The research shows that people who are happy, who smile and laugh, they are more creative than more serious people. Right? Now, why is that? Because when you laugh, your body releases endorphins, it releases uh, dopamine. But also what it does is when you laugh together with people you like, okay, this is where the connecting time comes in. When you're with people you really like and you feel comfortable and safe with, you're much more likely to share your good ideas because you feel socially accepted and safe. Now, the other thing that happens is when you're with people you love, your body releases a chemical called oxytocin. It's a bonding chemical. When that oxytocin gets released, you become more collaborative. And collaboration is a key aspect when it comes to creativity and innovation. All right. So have a think about that for folks for a moment. Have a think about those things. And here's what I want you to do. Okay. Answer in the chat box right now. Answer for me in the chat box. On average, how many hours? Sorry, in the in the poll. Answer in the poll. It's up now. How many hours of sleep on average do you get? Let's go. Please put it in the in the in the in the in the poll. Wonderful. Great. Well, okay, let's um, share the results now. Oh, we're still coming in. Wow, okay. Now, great to see, great to see that about 64% of you are getting adequate amounts of sleep. Okay, if you're six or seven hours, it's still not optimal. 
But what is really worrying here is that we have 36% of people who are getting less than six hours sleep a night. That is really worrying. If you do that consistently over time, you will absolutely not perform at your cognitive best. Your, those amylid proteins are not being cleared. Your synapses are not performing as they should. Now, the other risk here is that if you get less than six hours sleep consistently for years, you're at risk of early onset dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So start to get more sleep, folks. Very important. All right. Now, now that we've got that in, I want to share with you a, a little quiz. Okay. So let's go back now. Let's go back to the slide. And here's what I want you to reflect upon for a moment. All right. I've just mentioned sleep. And as we see, 36% of you are not getting enough. For those of you who are not getting enough, this is how you would score it. So what I want you to do now is take your notepad and, and your pen, and I want you to write down these um, seven different dimensions we talked about. And then what I want you to do is I want you to give yourself a score out of five for each dimension. So for those people, 36% of you who get less than six hours sleep at night, on sleep time, you would get a score of two because it's not a linear uh, a linear correlation. If you're getting less than six hours sleep, it's very unhealthy. If you're getting four hours sleep a night, that would be a one. If you're getting eight hours sleep a night or more, give yourself a five. That's great. Okay. Now think about physical time. If you exercise at least three times a week for at least 20 minutes, aerobic exercise, because that's the stuff we really need for brain health, score yourself a five. If you're giving at least three times of 20 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. All right, if the only exercise you get is doing this, lifting your smartphone to your ear and playing with your finger on the screen, that does not qualify as exercise. That's one, all right? Give yourself a rough score. How about focus time? If you are spending at least three times a week spending 20 minutes focused on problems, challenge issues in a non-distracted state, great, give yourself a five. But maybe some of you are not doing that at all. Now, for playtime, that is what we talked about there. It's having fun. If you at least three times a week, have a blast, laugh, have fun, do something you love, play games, sing karaoke, relax and enjoy, put that in there. Then you've got uh, connecting time, which is spending time with people you love, downtime. And time in is the most difficult one for people. Time in is really doing nothing. Do you make time on a weekly basis to really do nothing? Sometimes I see people give themselves a zero for this one. However, if you engage in meditation, if you engage in a long bath by yourself, long shower in your mind, if you do that three times a week for 15 minutes, you're doing well. Score yourself four or five. Okay. So please tally that up now for me. And what I want you to do now is I want you to type into the chat box, what is your score? What do you give yourself out of Total potential score of 35. Well, Ang has 30. Ang, good for you. You give yourself 30. You're going to be performing at your mental, your cognitive best. Uh-oh, Jane has a 13. Jane, I'm going to talk about you. That's a problem. 13 is not good, Jane. Okay. Oh, Chua, you've got a six. Chua, okay, if you're not actually joining this webinar from the hospital, Make sure you have like the emergency services number nearby, all right? Six is really not healthy, my friend. Jessica has 24. That's pretty good. Giuliani has 21. Norlin has a 13. No, it's not really. No, it's not healthy. Oh, oh, Chua doesn't actually have the energy to put in a number. He just put a crying face. That's a bit sad, Chua. I'm, I'm really sorry for you in that one. Okay, folks, look. Now, here's what the research tells us. Now, this is very, very important, folks. I'm just going to quickly have a look at the chat box as well while I'm doing that. Let's have a look now. Let's have a look what the, what, what the research tells us. So if you have a score, you know, of 30, over 30, you're doing great. 25, you're doing pretty well. Why? Because you're looking after, where am I? As we said, we're looking after brain, body, okay? Brain, body. If you're up in this range, you're going to be performing cognitively much better than many of the people around you. However, already when we get to this kind of score, 20, you're really at risk of impaired cognitive function. You're not going to be at your creative best. You're not going to be able to deal with complex and problems and come up with solutions well. Now, 
if we get down to these kind of numbers, we really have a worry because some of you were putting in scores of 13. The research shows that if you do that in a sustained way over time, you're at risk of a burnout, okay? And if you're on a score under 10, we really have some issues here, okay? Now, basically, if you're a score under five, you're dead. So you're probably not joining in this session. Um, someone put in a score of six, that's a bit worrying, all right? So, so here's the thing, right? Now, when you look at this, you think, what the heck has this got to do with the idea of digitalization. Well, it's got everything to do with it, right? Because what is the research pointing us towards? As I said at the very start of the session, what the World Economic Forum research says, what the LinkedIn research says, is it's not about the technology. The technology, we can understand it. We can understand the fundamentals of AI or big data or cloud, mobility, automation. We can understand that but making sense of it to apply it in the real world to solve complex problems, whether it's about COVID-19 or digital innovation or sustainability, that's the issue. And if we wanna be able to do that, we have to be performing mind body. We have to be looking after that, all right, to perform um, at our cognitive best. Okay, time's almost up. I'm just gonna have a quick look um, if there's any questions active now. Um, yeah, people are saying that, that in Singapore, burnout is a real issue. Absolutely, it is. Not just in Singapore, all over the world. It is a pandemic today. Why? Because of always on, always working. We're not giving ourselves the time in, the downtime, the exercise that we need, all right? And what the research shows is actually the top performers in the world, they look after that mind-body connect. So be aware of the risk there that if we want to perform well. Okay, folks, it's time to wrap it all up. I'm just looking now. Um, we're almost time is almost up. So here's what I want to do. I just want to bring this all together now because we've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about creative thinking and how you can actually bring your best creative mind into the world to thrive as an individual, to help your organization to thrive, and of course, to help Singapore to thrive. And what we fundamentally talked about are three things. The first thing is you need to think about the way you're thinking. Right? Don't act like a corporate zombie. Don't act like a robot. Take time to think. And that is about creating that time for deep work. What that also then involves is questioning things. Question your education. Question your experience. Question the environment you find yourself in. And very importantly, have the courage to step up. Have the courage to bring your ideas and to challenge things a little bit. Because unless we have the courage to change, nothing changes, right? And the last piece of this, of course, is that it's not just about what happens up here between the ears, all right? Performing at your creative best, at your cognitive best, is a whole body experience. It's about the mind-body connect, and that is also about looking after your health and well-being, right? So with that, what I'd like to do is just say a huge thank you to all of you for your amazing questions, for your interaction in the chat. And what I would love to do is to stay connected with all of you. As I've mentioned, I have other talks. I've got um, blogs. I've got articles. So please connect with me, whether it's on LinkedIn, on Instagram um, or on Twitter. And certainly I would like to continue the dialogue with all of you. So I'd love to have your last feedback, certainly in the chat box, how you've enjoyed the session. But on my behalf, I have to say I've had an absolute blast. So wishing you every success for the future. And thank you all again for this wonderful session. It was a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thank you.